Good afternoon, this is Dr. Mwaba. Today's lecture is on urinary tract infection in children. So why bother talking about urinary tract infection in children? Uh, firstly, urinary tract infections are quite common in childhood. In fact, in one study done at the University Teaching Hospital here in Lusaka, Dr. Mwinga demonstrated that up to 30% of febrile children will have a culture-proven urinary tract infection. The second reason is that I'd like us to look at what the diagnostic criteria for making a diagnosis of uh, UTI is and then discuss what the appropriate treatment would be for the various subtypes. And then finally, apart from just causing morbidity in childhood and, you know, being a disturbance for the child, the family, urinary tract infections can become serious can complicate into urosepsis, which obviously is um, a high risk uh, for death in the child, can result into renal scarring later on, can cause um, hypertension later on as a result of the renal scarring, and has been associated with pregnancy-induced complications such as hypertension later on in life, and there's also a risk of causing chronic kidney disease later on in life. This is especially so for children who go on to develop recurrent urinary tract infections. The objectives of this le lecture are that we want to know what the definition of urinary tract infection is, and then we'll look at the diagnostic criteria, risk factors, and classification, and then we'll briefly talk about treatment of urinary tract infection. So by way of definition, we can look at urinary tract infection as the presence of multiplying bacteria in the urinary tract as evidenced by positive uh, culture uh, in the presence of concurrent evidence for active infection. So the patient has to be symptomatic. The gold standard for diagnosis of urinary tract infection is urine culture. But this presents a bit of a challenge in children because um, collection of the specimen of urine may be quite challenging in, young, in younger children. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, younger children, in particular infants who are still in diapers, um, may have a contaminated perineum and so therefore chances of collecting contaminated specimens um, are higher. Um, and so in that population of children, uh, uh, one would do a superfubic uh, aspiration of urine from the bladder and using that method therefore any growth from that specimen would be considered as diagnostic of a urinary tract infection because as we know the bladder is sterile so any growth of urine would be considered as diagnostic of a urinary tract infection. In children who have been toilet trained um, one can instruct the, the child to start voiding and then try and catch not the initial flow of the urine, but the middle stream of the urine. And the reason why, why, why one would do this is to allow the initial flow of the urine to wash away any contaminants from the urethral opening. And using this method, um, a, a, any growth above 100,000 colony forming units per mil would be considered as diagnostical urinary tract infection. Um, one can also use an in and out uh, catheter to collect urine but this method can be distressing for the patient and the parents as well and if one uses an in and out catheter then um, the growth of 50,000 colony forming units per mil or in some guidelines 10,000 colony forming units per mil would be considered as diagnostic of a urinary tract infection. So it's important here to mention that even if you get growth of more than 10,000 colony forming units in freshly voided urine but the patient is symptom free, that would not be considered as a urinary tract infection that is defined as a symptomatic bacteriuria. It's important to rule out the possibility of contamination having occurred by repeating the sample collection and sending the specimen 
for culture. And one has to demonstrate the growth of the same organism to make this diagnosis of asymptomatic bacteria. And studies have shown that the organisms that cause asymptomatic bacteria tend to be of low virulence and therefore have little risk of causing renal scarring. Um, this applies in both children who have abnormal and normal anatomy. And so therefore, there is no need to give antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteria. I just wanted to get that out of the way. The other question that one normally gets is, how about urinalysis? Well, urinalysis is convenient. It will give you uh, results almost immediately. But it's important to remember that urinalysis is a screening test. You cannot rule out the presence of a UTI based on urinalysis. For us to say definitively that a patient does not have a UTI, we have to do the gold standard test which is urine culture. So coming back to the urine dipstick, usually we would look at the leukocyte esterase positivity. So remember that when there's inflammation in the urinary tract, we get an invasion of white cells um, into the lumen of the urinary tract. And we know that white cells produce this enzyme called leukocyte esterase. So the, what the deep stick is testing is the presence of that leukocyte esterase. And so when it is positive, it's highly suggestive of the presence of white cells in the urine, which is suggestive of a urinary tract infection. But remember, there are other causes of um, invasion of white cells in the urine. For example, just a patient who has systemic infection can end up with white cells in the urine. A patient who has non-infectious inflammation or in the kidneys can end up with white cells in the urine. And then the second thing is, is that I want us to just remember that there are certain organisms that have been demonstrated to be less likely to induce production of white blood cells in urine. Uh, organisms such as Pseudomonas, Enterococcus, and Klebsiella. So just by virtue of not having white cells on dipstick does not mean that you have ruled out UTI in your patient. Um, this test has um, a high sensitivity between 67 to 94 percent but much lower specificity. As I've said other things can also cause white cells in urine, things like non-infectious inflammation. Uh, we often see white cells in patients with AKI patients with, uh, uh, with glomerulonephritis, okay? Now, the other test that we do on dipstick uh, is uh, to check for the presence of nitrites. So what's, what's happening there is dietary nitrates are converted by bacteria into nitrites. So Klebsiella and Enterococcus, again, are less likely than E. coli. To do this conversion. So just because nitrites are negative does not mean your patient does not have a UTI. And then the second thing is that infants tend to pass urine more frequently. They void, they void more frequently and therefore they may wash out the substrate before this chemical reaction occurs. Um, because you need about four hours for this conversion to occur. So just because of that, nitrites are less um, sensitive in infants, but they have a high specificity of between 90 to 100%, and overall sensitivity is low, about 53%. And then just as a side note, dipstick blood and protein have poor sensitivity and specificity in diagnosis of urinary tract infection. So. Uh, please, uh, nobody should then uh, say, because I have blood, because I have protein on this patient's dipstick, you know, this is a UTI. So they are poorly sensitive and uh, poor sensitivity for diagnosis of urinary tract. Urinary tract infections can be classified anatomically depending on which part of the urinary tract is affected. When we have urinary tract 
uh, infections occurring in the kidney or ureter that's known as upper urinary tract infection these are associated with systemic features have a high risk of um, causing urosepsis and then we have lower urinary tract infections these are the infections affecting the bladder and the ureter so why would anyone get a urinary tract infection after all remember we have um, an immune system largely innate immune system but an immune system nonetheless that's operational in the urinary tract infection um, we have the uroepithelium that acts as a barrier we know that normally urine will flow in one direction from the upper tract to the lower tract without any reflux and this tends to wash out any pathogens we know that the urinary epithelium produce mucins that aggregate um, these uh, pathogens together with the residue cells and therefore uh, increase chances of them being washed out of the urinary tract um, the urinary tract has sulfated and an ionic glycosaminoglycans uh, on the bladder luminal surface which are antibacterial we know that there's this umbrella cell exfoliation um, that is triggered by fimbri proteins we have other proteins that bind uh, E. coli fimbri and prevent interaction with various receptors we also have uh, lactoferrin and lipocalin which prevent collection of iron by um, invading bacteria the body produces soluble immunoglobulin A we also have other natural antimicrobial peptides cytokines and chemokines things like defensins that are produced by the urinary tract to protect the body and then finally we have toll-like receptors that are part of the innate immune system and these are triggered by pumps and initiate a production of cytokines that induce um, movement of cellular components of the innate immune system things like neutrophils uh, into the lumen of the uh, urinary tract okay so then why would anyone get a urinary tract infection so one factor is the fact that one uh, gets infected by uh, uropathogenic organisms so these are organisms that have characteristics that allow them to bypass those natural defenses of the body so the prototype when it comes to thinking about pathogens that can cause urinary tract infections would be e coli for example which as you know is a gram negative fecal organism it's responsible for between 60 to 90 percent of urinary tract infections not all e coli uh, strains can cause uh, urinary tract infection it's particular uropathogenic strain and these strains tend to have virulence genes which determine their pathogenicity these uh, genes allow them to code for things like siderophore uh, systems these systems allow them to sequester iron remember iron um, is utilized by bacteria um, they need it in their nutrition uh, which would um, encourage um, their multiplication and then there are genes that encode things like hemolysin that lies red blood cells and lymphocytes and then finally these uropathogenic organisms uh, and we're using e coli as a prototype may actually encode um, adhesion molecules some of these are have to do with the fimbri and others are non fimbrial adhesions so those are the um, infecting organism factors that would allow invasion of the urinary tract other things that would allow invasion of the urinary tract by bypassing the uh, innate immune system that we spoke about 
is a disruption in the normal flow of urine. And we know that that can happen in patients that have uh, congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. So we get patients that have obstruction, obstructive uh, kidney conditions like posterior urethral valves. They have stasis of urine. They may have reflux of urine. And that um, takes away one of the defense mechanisms. Patients that um, have voiding dysfunction, patients that have neurogenic bladder, again, may have stasis. They may have um, reflux as well if the bladder is high pressure. The presence of foreign bodies in the uh, urinary tract, things such as Foley's catheter or stents for patients that may have stenting, will increase chances of bypassing those innate uh, immune system um, mechanisms of protection. And then patients that have had uh, invasive uh, genital urinary procedures. So here, what's happening is that we are contaminating the normally sterile environment. Chances of contaminating the normally sterile environment with perennial um, fecal organisms, uh, and this would occur in in situations like where patients go for cystoscopy, for example, or are having investigations using avoiding or micturating cysturethrogram. Constipation as well increases the presence of those fecal bacteria uh, in the perineal area, increasing chances of the bacteria ascending up the urethra and causing urinary tract infection. The female anatomy, women have a shorter urethra, uh, therefore making it easier for perineal fecal microbiota, microbiota to access the bladder. Patients that are immunosuppressed or diabetic patients and so on, and these are more prone to get a typical um, organisms causing the urinary tract. Sexual activity uh, has a massaging effect on the urethra, whereby these um, microorganisms in the perineal area are milked up into the bladder. Uh, infants are at higher risk of um, urinary tract infection. Um, there, I should have said sex as well. Girls at increased risk of, um, of urinary tract infection and then uncircumcised males. All right. Um, so among uh, children seen in general practice, uh, about 6 to 8 percent of children coming in with fever who actually have a urinary tract infection. Uh, as I had tried to, I had, as I had mentioned earlier uh, in Dr. Mwinga's study, uh, I think she found almost 30 percent of children less than 60 months who are admitted with fever of greater than 38.5 actually had a urinary tract infection. Clinical features of urinary tract infection tend to be non-specific, particularly in the pre-verbal age group. Upper urinary tract infections or pyelonephritis are often associated with um, high fever. Temperatures greater than 38.5. Children are often systemically unwell. They may be vomiting. They will have anorexia. They will complain of abdominal pain for those that are verbal. They may have renal angle tenderness, and then they also may have malaise as well as lethargy. Features of the lower urinary tract infection, like cystitis, um, include suprapubic pain, and then the child may have dysuria, uh, frequency, as well as urgency. As part of the clinical assessment, we need to make sure that as we see this patient that we think has a urinary tract infection, we, we try and figure out why they may have developed that urinary tract infection. So this includes inquiring after uh, symptoms that may be suggestive of uh, obstructed bladder. Uh, for example, things like uh, poor urine stream, hesitancy. One needs to palpate the bladder as well uh, to check if there's, um, you know, a distended bladder suggestive of uh, retention. Uh, one would want to find out if there's a history of any congenital uh, urinary anomalies. 
uh, one would want to find out about any history of a child having passed uh, stones, for example, any pain uh, in the patient that's suggestive of a stone. Uh, one would want to find out any history of constipation and then try and figure out if there are any features of bladder dysfunction, things like daytime wetting, urge incontinence, and so on. And then, of course, during the examination, one would examine the lower back, trying to see if there are any signs of spina bifida occulta, examine the tone in the lower limbs, and then palpate the abdomen, as I said earlier, to try and see if one can feel a distended bladder as well as any possibility of fecal masses that would be suggestive of chronic constipation. The second thing that uh, we have to do is to try and figure out if this patient has upper or lower urinary tract infection because this will influence how we treat the patient. So features of being systemically unwell are suggestive of upper urinary tract infection, whereas patients with lower urinary tract infection will tend to not be so sick and they will have things like dysuria and just suprafubic um, abdominal pain. And then there are various uh, investigations that can be done trying to figure out whether this patient has uh, upper or lower urinary tract infection. These are not routinely done, but I'll mention them under investigations. So as we discussed above, the gold standard for making the diagnosis is a urine culture. And we talked about the diagnostic criteria. If your patient is systemically unwell, you may also want to do other things such as uh, check their urinary function, uh, do, especially in neonates or children less than two months, you may want to do things like a lumbar puncture because chances of getting urosepsis meningitis are higher. Uh, one may want to do inflammatory markers, uh, things like C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, do a full blood count, uh, which if those are deranged, are highly suggestive of an upper rather than the lower urinary tract. And then under very exceptional circumstances, a DMSA can be done to try and figure out whether the patient has an upper or lower urinary tract infection, but this is not done routinely. And then uh, other imaging investigations that are warranted in anyone who has a first febrile UTI should be a kidney, ureter, bladder, ultrasound. That should be done because we want to make sure that we are not missing hydronephrosis or any other, um, you know, abnormality that could predispose this patient to getting a urinary tract infection. In old guidelines, anyone who who had culture positive febrile urinary tract infection had to have a micturating or avoiding cyst urethrogram. But guidelines have since changed, and so one would only do a micturating cyst urethrogram if there are specific indications. Like, for example, if one finds bilateral hydronephrosis, um, if one finds um, that the patient has a poor urine stream, and other indications for. A micturating urethrogram. In terms of treatment, uh, that's determined on whether one thinks that the patient has lower uh, versus upper urinary tract infection. So for lower urinary tract infection, treatment duration is five to seven days, largely with oral medication, unless there's a reason, you know, like if the patient is vomiting or cannot tolerate oral medication or in infants. Um, in whom oral medication administration may be a challenge, then one would go for IV treatment. The specific choice of oral antibiotic is guided by local sensitivity patterns, but some examples of antibiotics that could be used would be amoxicillin, amoxicillin with calavulinic acid, nitrofurantoin, nalidixic acid, and cephalexin. In the context of the university teaching hospital, we do not generally use um, septrin to treat cystitis, I guess because there's so much uh, septrin use. We use it as prophylaxis uh, in, for example, for PCP, 
and so many other things. So we do not use septum to treat cystitis. Upper urinary tract infection treatment initially should be intravenous. Treatment is from 7 to 14 days depending on the severity and choice of initial empirical antibiotics includes things like um, ciprofloxacin, cefotaxin, ceftriazine, and gentamicin. Once the patient has improvement in their clinical condition, one can transition them to oral antibiotics as long as you treat for a total of 7 to 14 days. Prevention of uh, urinary tract infection. Remember, during our clinical assessment, we were particularly interested in trying to figure out whether our patient had any features of bowel and bladder dysfunction. So if one identifies, for example, that the um, patient has chronic constipation, it's important to deal, to deal with the constipation so that there's no recurrence of urinary tract infection. If the patient has bladder dysfunction, it's again important to manage that so that we reduce chances um, of recurrence of infection. And then special populations may benefit from uh, prophylactic antibiotics. For example, patients who we find to have high-grade reflux or patients who have uh, anatomical uh, abnormalities. For example, in our context, patients um, with posterior urethral valves we tend to put on septum prophylaxis. So the major points to take home are firstly that urinary tract diagnosis is by demonstration of urine culture positivity in a patient who is symptomatic. It's important to use the correct specimen collection technique. There's no role for bag urine or cotton wool specimen as specimens meant for urine culture because otherwise it will all just be contamination, give you false positive results. Beware of asymptomatic bacteriuria. Remember that the risk factors which are associated with disruption of the innate immunity of the urinary tract um, must be checked for specifically during your history and examination. And then treatment must be long enough using appropriate antibiotics refer to local resistance patterns and all patients who have febrile UTI must have a kidney, ureter and bladder ultrasound. These are the references that are used in the preparation of these slides. I would encourage you to look at the review articles so that you can understand uh, what we've discussed in greater detail. Thank you so much for your attention.